namaste. Well, we did a live stream last night and the same old question of someone pretending to be on a higher spiritual level than they actually are came up again. Uh, I mean, it's like the 437th time I've had to deal with this question. And the reason this thing even comes up at all is due to a misunderstanding of what is truth. Okay? We are used to a material, mechanistic definition of truth. You know, for example, like in physics, if F equals MA in my lab, F equals MA anywhere in Euclidean space, you know, if the area of a circle is pi R squared on a flat surface, then it's pi r squared everywhere on any flat surface. Okay, but these are physical truths. Okay, they are not mental or spiritual or truths related to consciousness. See, but where we really live and how we see the world is completely dependent on our consciousness. So, what is true for a person in one state of consciousness will not be true for a person in another state of consciousness. Okay? In other words, objective truth, truths about the world, are universal. But subjective truths can vary from person to person, depending on their state of consciousness. Now, I've posted this chart, I don't know how many times on videos on this channel, probably hundreds of times by now, over the last three years or so. I discovered this system in a rather obscure book by and about Ramana Maharshi. And then I went looking for its source and I found it in the commentary on Vedanta Sutra by Sripad Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya. So it's very esoteric and it's very elevated, but it's also foundational. You know, we define foundational truth as a truth that applies in all time and space to everybody and which leads one towards self-realization. So, look at the chart. Let it sink deep into your mind. No, I'm just kidding. You really should absorb all this information. You know, pause the video. Take a screenshot. Keep this on your computer. Study it. Don't just look at it. Study it and think it through. Now, a person whose consciousness is primarily on the lower three chakras is going to see the world as real. They see their body as real. They see other people as real. And they see the world as composed of solid objects and so on and so forth. Now, a person in this consciousness, which is 99% of everybody who's interested in spiritual life, okay, anybody who's below this state of consciousness is just an animal walking on two legs. We're not even going to consider them. But of the people who have some relationship with spirituality, most, almost all, are on the level of Dvaita Vada. Dvaita means duality and Vada means a view. 
a view or a system of truth, a teaching. And we see that almost all of the religions in the world teach on the level of duality. So this is the consciousness of the vast majority, and this is called Jagrat consciousness. Jagrat means there are many objects, a multitude of objects and things. And the yoga that is appropriate for these people is karma yoga. Karma yoga means the ritualistic performance of pious activities. And what are pious activities? Well, first you have to take reasonably good care of your body. You have to be in good health. You have to be educated. You have to make sure you get a good education so you can understand the scriptures. You have to read the scriptures. You have to think about the scriptures. And you have to do the things that are described in the scriptures as dharma or duty. So that includes worshiping some god or goddess, or several, huh? whatever, according to your taste, with rituals according to your means. And most of these rituals involve giving, offering, huh? Val valuable things, precious things, beautiful things to the god or goddess of your choice. Why do they do that? To develop a higher consciousness and more importantly, to collect enough pious karma, good karma, shubha karma, to deserve a higher level of consciousness. And this, according to Buddha's four uh, basic truths, four noble truths, is the level of suffering. You know you're suffering. You want to get out of suffering. And if you're honest, you will not pretend to be in any of the higher states of consciousness. But you will do your duty. You will worship your guru. You will perform the ritualistic activities as directed by the scriptures and the guru. And you will get the karmic results that allow you to advance further. And what does that further advancement look like? When you develop spontaneous love for your god or goddess. Now, this can't be faked. It can be imitated, however, but it should not be. If you're an honest person, you won't imitate love. You know, love is one of those things that just happens. And if you love someone, it means you're committed. You're committed to that person. That's why we have marriage. That's why we have families. That's why all these instructions are given in the scripture, to get initiated by a guru. That means a lifetime connection. And similarly, the connection with your god or goddess, your ishta devata, should be a lifetime connection, actually more than a lifetime connection. Not that you frivolously take up worship of one God and then drop it and take up another. No. But what happens is that as you accrue pious karma, you spontaneously develop love for the God or goddess that is most close to your heart. And now the activities, the external activities don't change, but the internal consciousness changes. And this is called Vishishta Dvaita Vada. At this stage, one has assimilated the truths of the scriptures and knows that the ultimate truth is non-dual. But one has not realized that yet. And so there's still a difference between myself as an individual and others, including God or goddess. One sees God or goddess as different from oneself, as external to oneself, and still as an object of worship, but now also as an object of love. 
And this gradually leads to the internal experiences of bhakti leading up to prema. Now, this state of consciousness is very interesting because it's related to svapna, the dream consciousness. And skeptics, of course, will say that, oh, this love of God and all this is just a dream. Well, maybe it is, but so what? When you're in a dream, for example, a scary dream, like you're being chased by an, a tiger or an animal or something, or a ghost, you really feel scared, isn't it? The dream has a possibility to evoke an actual emotional, mental, and even physical state. You wake up from a scary dream and your heart is pounding, you're breathing hard, you're sweating, right? So dreams have their own reality. Now, if this state of divine love is cultivated further, it leads spontaneously, again, to the next stage, Vivartavada. And in Vivartavada, then one begins to concentrate on the non-dual state. Now, this is already very, very high. If, if you're meditating, like, according to some instructions in some book, or if you have like a fixed time to meditate or a certain method of concentrating on a certain object, this is not really meditation. It may be preliminary to meditation, but it's not meditation. See, in the, in the eight limbs of yoga, there's yama, niyama, the preparatory uh, do's and don'ts. Then there's asana, pranayama, regulation of the breath. Then pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses from their objects. How many of you can do this? Withdraw the senses from their objects, including the mind. Pratyahara. Then the next stage is dharana. Dharana means concentration. Concentration of what? Consciousness. And what is that consciousness? Sushupti. Sushupti means consciousness of nothing. No object. That's all there in the chart. Now, this cannot happen by force of will because will is part of the ego. Huh? It's part of the, what's called the antakarana, which is the internal psychological structure of the individual. But in real meditation, in actually even in concentration, the antakarana disappears. Antakarana disappears, and so does consciousness of the senses and the mind. Ego, all this just disappears, and what's left is only concentrated, pure awareness. And that is what becomes samadhi, which is the highest level of yoga practice. This cannot happen as an act of will. It has to happen because you're qualified for it by completing the lower practices. It can't happen any other way. And when meditation matures after long practice, it becomes the highest level of ajatavada. Ajatavada means unborn. One sees the world as unborn. One sees oneself as unborn. In fact, one doesn't see uh, individual self as any different from the rest of the world. One sees one whole illusion of Saguna Brahma. And one sees the self, 
or one experiences being the self, the unlimited pure awareness that is at the root of all existence. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.